Hey, last night, the much-anticipated Malice at the Palace was on uh, Netflix. Uh, I watched that. I know several people watched that. Um, mm-hmm. It was uh, Wyatt said he watched it. He was only two when that happened, but it gave him a whole new understanding. Uh, there are so many people that weren't around. I was around, I remember, but that was in 2004. And a lot of different thoughts probably then and now as to everything that happened, how it happened. But you, uh, great I lived it. context there. Yeah. You, uh, what is your take from it then and now? Well, first of all, I'm a little upset because I've been trying for about uh, 10 years to do a documentary or a book. And I've sent out all kinds of, um, uh, you know, thoughts and ideas to different publishers and documentarians and haven't been able to make it happen. And these guys were able to make it happen. So I'm jealous as hell. Um, But secondly, it, it didn't change my general thought that, you know, that our test was, look, there was shared culpability across the board. You know, the fans, Ben Wallace, uh, the, the security detail, um, certainly three Don cops. Green, the cup three thrower. cops. Yeah. They had three right. police officers. Right. There's a lot of lot of pe- lot of blame to go around, but I still think, uh, and this may not be popular, I still think the the bulk of the culpability goes to Ron, uh, who, you know, was not really in his right mind at that at that point. And he, he was set off by something that I think would set off a lot of us. Uh, nobody wants beer poured on them. Uh, certainly not me. I'd rather drink it. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's a very interesting documentary. It's got some new footage. Uh, you hear uh, Jamal Tinsley yell over to uh, our test, you can take your hard foul now. And that's exactly what he did with 45.9 seconds to go that set the whole thing off. My question is one that was never answered, and maybe I'll ask Rick Carlisle someday. Why were so many of those starters still out there in a 15, 17 point game, uh, you know, with 45.9 seconds to go? I don't, I don't understand that, but that's, you know, that's all hindsight, but it's, it's very interesting. And I think anybody who's a Pacer fan, well, you know, especially people who feel like the Pacers got screwed by David Stern. I don't, I mean, what, what's he supposed to do? give Ron Artest 20 games. I mean, it was a a riot. Um, But I I, I thought that Jermaine came off. The prosecution, the prosecution up there actually did come down hardest on the fan and put the blame on that fan for throwing the cup and starting it all. uh, Well, the legal, the the legal element of it. Yeah. The legal element of it is different from, when you have a, a business, you know, let's say, let's say uh, I get popped for a DUI or something. Now, the law may be, may go soft on me and maybe, you know, whatever, uh, take classes or whatever it might be. But my, my employer may come down much harder on me. They may even fire my, my sad behind. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think you really can compare there. Um, I think that um, the David Stern understood that there is a disconnect, whether you like it or not, there is a disconnect between the perception of NBA players, read black players and the reality of them. And I think that he found, he felt that it was important to protect the brand, protect the fans. And again, uh, you know, culpability all around, but, uh, I, I primarily put it on our test and, I did not have a great deal of trouble with uh, the sentences, if you will, that David Stern brought uh, brought forth. Uh, Jermaine O'Neal, popular around here. uh, Jermaine O'Neal obviously was probably affected the most. I mean, he seemed like a young kid. Man, he just wanted to win uh, for much of that, and that's his focus was about winning. And but he really seemed to be affected the most out of that. Uh, Steven Jackson was just like, still to this day, man, he was like, I'm just protecting my guys. And, um, that's it. And let me tell you something. I, I, I talked to Steven Jackson a couple of weeks ago for a story that's going to appear in the athletic, I believe tomorrow it's about Rick Carlisle and the different iterations of his career through, through the years in, in, uh, Indianapolis. And he was saying, he was telling me, he said, look, I had a younger brother or an older brother, excuse me 
who was murdered, who was beat to death on the streets uh, of Port Arthur, Texas. And he said from that day on, I always said I would be my brother's keeper. And you saw it during the whole um, Floyd situation uh, in Minnesota, uh, where how he stepped up and became uh, a major voice um, on, on the behalf of, of, of the movement. And um, so, yeah, I, I understand Stephen Jackson. He, he still to this day has no regrets about it. Um, you know, poor, poor Ron. I mean, Ron saw uh, a lot of uh, domestic violence in his family. And it's, it, it's uh, these guys grow up, you know, in, in difficult situations. I understand that. But I still think that there is a line of demarcation that cannot be breached between the players and the fans. And everybody went over the line that night. It was, it was just an ugly scene.